I'm going to say good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Today, we're going to talk about the changes. There's been a lot of changes, believe it or not, to contracts, and uh, some very recent. One as of March 26th that I thought was a little bit interesting because if I did not hear it on the, uh, I think it was in the Florida Realtors, Margie Grant had said about the new buyer retainer, and it's actually also a tenant retainer agreement. I didn't even know it was there. And as an educator, a licensed instructor, I teach contracts at the board. I thought it was really bizarre that I had known nothing about it. So uh, I was very excited. So I started looking into this and I thought this is absolutely something that we all need to know about. We need to be versed in. We need to be making sure we're staying on top of all these changes. We know there's going to be a lot more changes. Changes are coming, um, but we need to make sure Flavia, that we're on top of all the changes as they happen. Now, just so you guys know, and um, if you were with me on Thursday, we talked about it. If you weren't with me on Thursday, we're just going to talk about it briefly. Very funny. So I had in one year, Stellar Broker, because uh, that that Stellar Broker thing was happening at the same time as the Florida Realtors conversation. They were going on at the same time. And it was a conflict. It was very interesting. So some of the information that was coming about was not matching. <laughs> and this is what I want you to be aware of. Nobody really knows what's happening, guys. So, uh, and, it, you know, I will share with you, even in the board when we were discussing things, there are brokers right now that are coming up with their own broker-buyer agreements. There are Florida realtors that are working on the broker-buyer agreements. And I will tell you, FREC is working on their broker-buyer agreement. So why is anybody going to panic right now and concentrate on a broker-buyer agreement when the reality is we don't know which one we're going to have to use? right? Is Florida Realtors going to be the mandated one? Is FREC going to be the mandated one? Are we going to have to start with Florida Realtors and change over to FREC? We don't know. We don't need to worry about it, guys. I guarantee what will be changing in the language will have to do with the enforceability of the contract, not what we're going to give to the buyer, not our transaction brokerage status, not what their duties to us are going to be. Those things are all going to be the same. And I guarantee they will all have language that the commission is negotiable. <laughs> That we know for sure. But other than that, um, what will vary probably greatly is how it will be enforceable. Will it be will it be mediation? Will it be arbitration? Will it be a lien on the property like in commercial? I can only hope. But <laughs> that's the one I'm voting for. I love that in the commercial contract. But I don't know. That is what we don't know. Okay. But in reality, when you're talking to Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you're going to be explaining, guys, if you don't pay me, we're going to put a lien on your property. Uh, probably not. Okay. And I can guarantee you when you're explaining the commercial co contract, you don't share that part either. I mean, they can read, right? So the reality is that's not going to matter. So you need to be getting very comfortable regardless of the buyer broker agreement as it stands, because the important parts of that are all going to stay the same. I guarantee you the changes are not going to be in the, what the, in the meat of that agreement as it stands as it is right now. It's really going to be, in my opinion, in the forcibility section of that. Okay. So um, we're going to take a look at and see some of the other changes. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and let's go ahead and, oh, well, oh, that was really weird. Did you guys see what I did there? How did I even do that? I don't even know. All right, let's make this. There we go. Uh -huh. There we go. And slideshow. All right. So. These are some of the contract changes, okay, that we have. We have the new prospect buyer tenant retainer agreement. That is the brand new one that I adore. If you guys remember when I've done presentations on the buyer broker agreement in my own personal business, when I had an international brokerage, I actually used the retainer portion of that contract. But it was a little convoluted because like you had to write, did someone say something? In the additional terms, how the retainer was going to be collected, if there was a time that they would get the money back, if it was going to apply to the sale, you would have to actually modify that. Well, what's great is they've taken that whole portion out and created one agreement just simply for this. So we're going to look at that. They also have some addendas that happened, some uh, different things we're going to look at in March. There were updates actually in January we're going to look at. And then, obviously, we can't forget about the foreign national law that we all know, Law 264, that we all love, that there's seven countries of concern that cannot be purposing 
different types of property. So this is actually the contract. And I have people who are trying to get in. So I'm going to stop this share for a second and we're going to admit them. And I'm actually going to just, you know what? I'm going to end them and I'm going to share. I'm going to show you where I put this because I think it's important that you know how to get to this. Oh no. Hold on. Let's end the show. End show. And I'm going to go over here a second. Stop share. Mm, this is special. Share. Okay. If you want to see here, when you go into dot loop, I have put it in here for you. So if you go into dot loop and you go under buyer, you will see under buyer, you have exclusive broker buyer agreement. Now I want you guys to be very clear about this. There's still confusion on this and I want everybody to understand this. The broker buyer agreement does not mean that you're changing your agency. There are three different agencies, right? Single agency transaction broker and no brokerage relationship. There's a fourth broker buyer agreement which says transaction to transition to transaction. I have pulled out just the transaction brokerage agreement. So I highly recommend that you get your broker buyer agreement if you're gonna use it. And I highly recommend that you start using it to get comfortable with it, that you use it right here because I've pulled out the proper one. Because I've seen you guys start to use these, which is so exciting, but sometimes you're using transition to transaction. You don't need your transition to transaction. We are transaction already. Please don't use single agency. If you by accident pull out a single agency agreement, you are now a single agent to that buyer. Do you know what that means, guys? You can't show many of our listings because we are transaction brokers. So you can't be on both sides. It can't be our listing and you're representing the buyer. That's the whole point. That's called dual agency, which is illegal in the state of Florida. So you have to be very careful which, which brokerage agreement you're using, which is why I've taken the time to make sure we pulled out the proper one, transaction brokerage. Is there any questions on this? Because I think it is very critical we understand that. Any questions? In here, I pulled out the new form, Prospective Buyer Tenant Agreement. See it? It's right here. And it is so great. So we're going to look at it. Ready? The prospective buyer, or you could use this for a tenant. So guys, God help you. You know, sometimes we get asked that question. Can you help so-and-so find a rental? They're going to be buying in a couple months, but first they need a rental. Guess what? Now you can charge them because... We're not going to get paid anything from the other side. We know that, right? So this means that they can pay you for their services. So you select tenant there. This person agrees to utilize the services of our brokerage to assist the prospect in locating the acquisition of suitable real property. So that's whether they're going to purchase it or, or rent it, right? The term acquire or acquisition includes purchase, option, exchange, lease, or the acquisition of the interest in the real property. So no matter what you're helping them do, they're covered in this agreement. We really don't do anything other than purchase or lease, by the way. We don't deal in options. We don't deal in exchanges. And I really hate option to purchase. It's a bad one too. Like get an attorney if you're going to do that. Okay. So it'll be begin on the day you start working with them and it'll terminate on whatever day. Give yourself plenty of time here. Okay, I like a year personally. And if people are like, Carrie, that's an awful long time. I say, I know I love you so much. Should we make it longer? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm a little bit of a comedian myself, but I would just suggest if don't make this too short, you know, because the reality is how often do you find the perfect thing immediately? And do you want to keep rewriting these? I wouldn't want to. So my opinion, but do what you want. Here's the broker obligations. You're going to use professional knowledge and skill, discuss property requirements, and assist the prospect in locating and viewing the suitable properties, cooperate with other real estate licensees, if any, to assist the prospect in acquiring the real interest in the real property. So acquiring whatever means, right? Whatever, if it's leasing, we're not doing anything else, right? Leasing or buying. Fair housing. Of course, we have to address fair housing. The broker adheres to the principles expressed in fair housing 
add and will not participate in any act that unlawfully discriminates on the basis of race, color, sex, disability, uh, familiar status, country of national origin, or any other category protected under federal, state, or local law. I love how they added that because we all know they keep adding to that, right? So in case they add five more things, you're covered here. We don't have to change this because this one just came out, as you see, March, 2024. But fair housing could change tomorrow. So this is already covered because it says, and any other protected class. The retainer, here's the strength and the beauty of this. Upon final execution of this agreement, the prospect will pay the broker, ready? A non-refundable. Those are the magic, beautiful words to my ears. Retainer fee of whatever you want to make it, guys, $500, $1,000, $200, $2,000. Keith, this is a good one for those people in the villages. Instead of the broker-buyer agreement, sometimes you might want to use a retainer. Just to say. Anyway, for the broker services, this fee will not be credited to the prospect if compensation is earned. You don't have to worry about it. It is so clean. It's not going to be. And Florida statutes right here, 475.453, broker and prospect agree the retainer fee for the real estate services described herein does not constitute a fee paid for rental information list because that's illegal as described in that section. They sign it, you sign it, boom. You can collect the money and give it to the broker. Right there. You don't even have to give it to a title company. You give it to the broker along with this and we can put the money right in to pay you as an OPC. Don't have to have the money go be held with the title company. Why? It is non-refundable. It is not ever going to be applied to any purchase, guys. You collect this right in the beginning and you turn it right into us with an OPC. Is this not a beautiful thing? Do you see why I was super excited about this? I don't think most of my clients agree to this stuff. If you have a customer who's coming from another country who you're going to be running around with for X amount of days, this is a beautiful thing. Now, rentals? Why would you want to be working rentals? But this is perfect for a rental. Yeah, no, for most of the Mm -hmm. Now, when you start dealing with buyers and let's say the commission situation happens, you can now take fees for your services and say, listen, I'm going to take a fee and I'm going to try to work in that the commission is paid for. And if it's not paid for, I took a fee. You know, you can work this any way you want to. This can be used in any way, shape you want to use it. Doesn't matter. It's a non-refundable fee. It is a retainer fee for your services. We all seem to forget we are professionals. If you were an attorney, Flavia, would an attorney spend hours with a customer and not get paid? No. Services. But the services are guaranteed. What, what, what services are guaranteed? They're telling you information. No, no, but there are other services. Yeah, no premium on there. attorney is going to be... It's, it's what you're paying sales. for. Yeah. No, it's not different than sales. They're giving you what you are thinking is worth more. I'm sorry. My time giving them my expertise, driving them around, spending time, I think is worth more than the attorney because they could have gone to any attorney. But the attorney's going to charge them, right? No. I'm, I'm just worried about the, the mindset of the presenting. And well, I'm not saying you're going to use this all the time. This is going to have a time and a place. This is optional. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Not a requirement. You could use this in addition. You could use it without. You could use it for any rental. I just think this is a beautiful thing because the one, and let me show you this. If you're going to use the retainer that is in the broker-buyer agreement, it's a little convoluted. Let me show you. Here's the broker buyer agreement, which we love. Here, retainer. Upon execution of this agreement, buyer will pay broker a non-refundable retainer fee for broker services. This fee is, is not refundable and will or will not be credited if compensation is earned. So you choose if it's good. But if it is going to be credited, right, for how long? Who holds it? 
This is where it gets convoluted. So I've used this one where it will be credited, but for how long? You have to write additional information because is it, what if they don't buy for a year? What if they don't buy for two years? What is the length of time that it holds to? Who holds the money? How, how many title companies are willing to just hold a retainer fee of $2,500 or $5,000? Who's willing to do that for free? These are the things you have to think about. And that's why I've used this a ton of times. Because if I was driving down to Miami working with a foreigner, I'm not just doing that for free. So I would take all my expenses and my time, and that was my retainer fee. And it would be would be credited if they purchased it within a certain period of time. But I had to write all that down in here that I had written up by an attorney. And then I had my title company hold it. It's a pain. It's still says non-refundable. So yeah. would that be collected now? Yeah, you hold, you take it up front. You had to hold it with title. If you would say it was going to be credited, if it was not going to be credited, then you could deposit it because it was not going to be credited. But see, the other one's cleaner because that was just one thing they give you a check and you deposit it over here. But see, this one is a little convoluted. People liked it. I had no problem getting foreigners to sign it, tell you the truth at all. Because if I'm going to go spend the whole weekend driving around Miami searching for properties with them, they understood my time was worth money. Of course, I met them in their country first, too. So they understood they had to pay for me to go do that. But again, it's how and when you want to use it. I'm not saying you have to use it. I'm just saying who knew it was there? Nobody. I didn't even know it was there. So now you don't have to use the whole broker buyer agreement if you want to work with a, a let's say you have to deal with a, God help us, a renter. You don't have to worry about the renter paying us anything. You say, listen, it's $1,000 for my services to find you something. You do a retainer agreement and you go find them a, an apartment if you want to do that. If they pay you something, 50 bucks, you're lucky they pay something. If they don't, you're getting paid something to do something, right? That's your choice. Your time is worth money, guys, and it's up to you to decide how much and if you're willing to get it. But if you want to work for free, I can't stop you. But now is the time you got to start thinking about those things because as we get closer and closer to July, you're going to have to get better and better at being able to explain that, right? Everybody clear on that? All right. Let's get back over to here. So this is some other changes that have been made. Uh, what happened to my beautiful screen here? Okay. So let's play this from the, oh, not from the start here. Okay. Come on. Uh -huh. All right. So this is the next one. The exclusive right of sales listing agreements. Every one of them have been re revised. Did anybody know that? Because I didn't. I know, Flavio, right? But it's not a big change. What they changed in every one of them, you see down here? If this box is checked, refer to local MLS rules regarding the entry of the property. If this box is checked, it's in every listing agreement. That's what happened. What he used to say is you see the one up here? It, none of the, if this box is checked, the property cannot be placed in the MLS. Because it used to be, if you check the box, we couldn't put it in the MLS. Now we're saying you have to refer to what the rules are of the MLS. Because pretty soon you won't have any compensation showing in the MLS. So certainly we can't have, if you don't offer compensation that you can't put it in the MLS. <laughs> That's why they've already gone ahead and proactively changed that in every contract. Vacant land, it's exclusive right of sale. This is the commercial property, the vacant land and the, um, the regular exclusive right of sale listing agreement. Every contract has already been modified as of March. I, what I don't understand about the whole not listing compensation in the lab. Yep. They can do it on their company websites. So it's going to just create more work for us to find out what what does taking out of MLS actually accomplish? Absolutely nothing. Except give buyers agents a headache. Um, it's given attorneys um $85 million. That's, that's what it's done. I mean, effectively. So what I really think, Shane, other than the fact that this whole thing was really just a ploy for attorneys to make money, um, what they're trying to say is, okay, now buyers have the right 
to choose their agent based on how much they want to pay them. We could have done that before anyway. It doesn't mean that a seller can still not offer the compensation. They can. It doesn't mean that they can't show it. But one thing, and I will tell you this, this was very explicit on the broker seller MLS um, seminar that I listened to. It's not simply that they cannot have it on MLS anywhere. It can't be in Realtor Remarks. It can't be uploaded as supplement. It cannot be anywhere where there's an IDX fee. Now, on our website, with our IDX feed, it can show our, we can do it. They can't do it. They can't provide it. But we can have like IDC Global, our company, put it in there so that all of our listings show our compensation. We can do that. But we can't show Caldwell Bankers. Right. Their so job is to police that. If a buyer is interested in a house by Caldwell Banker. Now we have to go to Caldwell. Well, if or Caldwell Caldwell. Banker is going to do it. Right. So here's my point, guys. And, you know, nobody knows what's really going to happen. Let's put it this way. We don't know. What cannot happen is Zillow cannot start taking an IDX feed and showing everybody's. Because uh, now MLSs have to police that. And Zillow will be turned in and Zillow will be sued. So that's the point. So Zillow can't become the next platform. But who knows what will happen? The good news about it is, let's say there's a lot of lazy brokerages, because that's going to be costly to do that, right? That won't put it on their website. And agents won't be able to go look for it. To your point, is it a headache for buyer's agents? Absolutely. So do you not see an advantage, though, for us? Imagine you're an agent. You're probably a newer agent because you're a buyer's agent, right? You're trying to navigate this new world. You don't know who's going to pay you. Oh my gosh, what do I do? I don't know any other company other than Sotheby's who shows it on their website. I guess I'm just going to have to show all Sotheby's listings. Do you see that as a bad thing for Sotheby's? No. <laughs> now, with that said, is that truly fairness out there for the other sellers? Do I really care? I mean, that's not what they were supposedly creating, right? So to me, they've created a mess. But in reality, who did it? The attorneys who are just trying to make money, yeah. right? Um, just a question on yes. the, uh, the last document that you have is retainer fee. Yes, the retainer fee. So I guess Zillow and kind of sounds like it's geared towards renters per se. Um, it's buyers or renters, you could for either. Mm -hmm. The other one is, is I'm guessing also the same where it's like they have to pay uh, you the, the fee or anything like that. But on that retainer fee, let's say that you know, the buyer, you said something about um, turning it to the, the admin. So is it kept in escrow? So let's say you put $500, no. where is it? Who do they pay? They would pay to Premier Sotheby's. Well, they write a check and they send it. And you, or you take it and give it to Jill or whoever, or one of our OAs, and we can turn it in for you because it's non-refundable. If you use this form, it is non-refundable. It can be given to you. As an OPC check, if you so get it right away. Do we pay a split on retainers? Well, it would be just a commission to you. Yeah, it's the same yeah. thing. It'd be a commission. You'd just be collecting some. You would set it. Yeah, it's you. Whatever you're going to get paid. Buyers, and they're already scrambling money to put together for the stuff. How are you going to tell them, like, hey, you have to pay this retainer? If it's a first time home buyer, you're probably going to use a buyer broker agreement and you're going to try to get the seller to pay for it. That's a little bit different. I would say really the retainer fee, in my opinion, is great for a renter, right? And it's also good if you're dealing with some kind of like a foreigner or somebody who's coming to town, making you spend a lot of time with them and you have no idea if they're going to buy. No. We all know we have those customers. Th those are the ones that maybe you want to, and you might want to use the other form that says can be credited if they buy. Because if they buy, they can get the money back. If they don't buy, you want to get paid for your time. How many t how many of us have wasted days, weeks, hours, right? And then never got paid. Wouldn't it have been nice to say, listen, you buy within a year, you get that money. But if you don't, I get that money. Would have been nice, right? Now, mm -hmm. let's say that um, it's a client that you had worked with and you've worked with and you've sold them properly mm -hmm. for 18 more years and- you never had to sign like a buyer broker agreement or retainer fee, and now you do. But then the client is like, "Well, I don't want to sign it because you've already done business with me in the past. 
Well, the retainer fee is totally on you. The retainer fee is just another option for you. The buyer broker agreement, everybody will have to sign. That will be required. Everybody, not just here in the state of Florida, nationally will have to sign that. So will, will it be for getting under contract? Do you have to send in your buyer broker agreement? Or when you start sh the showings? Because a lot of buyers, especially like if we're sitting on the floor, somebody calls and we have a meeting, a lot of times they don't want to sign right there. You know, so I'm going to tell you. Sometimes they don't like you because they still want to get to know you. In this, in like North Carolina, it's required at the first time you meet them, just like your disclosure. Most states that have this already, you're required to do it at the first meeting. So and it depends on who makes this a requirement. If it's FREC, more than likely it'll be, be required at the first meeting. If it's Florida Realtors, it may, what, you point here? Oh, thank you. When you say meeting uh, or actually like going to uh, so meeting is just so I get when you just when you meet them in person, like a meeting. That is how it's done in this in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. You have to do your disclosure at the first meeting. Listen, it, even in the state of Florida, if you were a single agent or no brokerage relationship at the first meeting, you would also have to do that at the first time you meet them. But because we're transaction brokers, everybody's assumed to be a transaction broker, so we're not required. That could change too, guys. We I'm could have to do that. You're like going to go do business. Like, but if you're like, oh, if you'd like to just meet me. That's meet. not considered a real meeting. It depends oh. on what you're considering a meeting. Oh, if you're just okay. talking and getting to know somebody, if you're actually going through property and like a meeting, like a right. business meeting, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So tell me that you have to have this agreement. Yes, it is. The question is, here was the other conflict. Florida Realtor said Stellar is going to have to maintain them. Stellar said it's not going to be Stellar. <laughs> I don't know. We're going to have to see who's going to have to maintain them. But I'm going to tell you there was going to be somebody. You're going to have to turn in your agreements. They're going to be monitored. That's my question. Because yeah, we don't have that yet. I'm going to tell you I have previewed a system that you turn them in. Yeah. And you can see, like, if I turned it in and Alicia was the buyer and she's supposedly working with Anna, but she goes to turn it in and she can't turn it in because Anna's already registered with Teresa. What? Like, they we, they have those systems already. They're out there. I've already, I've already seen that. So whether it will be that type of system, that's a great system. Um, so it could be something like that already. We don't know. That's We'll have to wait and see what they go with, right? But those systems are already, a, a, they're already out there. I've already previewed that. I can mm -hmm. see buyers like signing with two people. And then hey. So what was cool about that system that I previewed? You also could see if it was a jumper, like Alicia jumper. She was with beforehand Linda and Keith and Flavia. You're like, she is a jumper. I don't want to sign her. She's going to leave me too, right? So you could see all that. It was a really cool system. So, um, you know, and you could see if somebody was pre-registered so you couldn't register them again because you could say, oh my gosh, she's already registered with Anna. I don't want to register her, right? So it was a really cool system, Alicia. But, <laughs> but um, you know, we don't know. Is that the system we'll go with? Will there be another one? We're not sure, but I'm sure they'll have something like that. Will it be Stellar that will be monitoring that? I don't know. Will it be Freck that's monitoring that? Who knows? We don't know, but it will be somebody, guys. That's for sure. Now, keep in mind, Florida Realtors said that the requirement really won't be till December. It's the National Association of Realtors that's making this come early. They're the ones instituting this in July. So they're probably trying to work out all the kinks before it's required, right? So that's probably one of the things that they're trying to figure out. Okay, any other? Yes. Um, so let's say, I think you guys mentioned... Um, mentioned something about that. So let's say the buyer signed buyer broker agreement with like three or four different agents, yeah. right? Then what if they go under contract with like let's say Shane and they had signed with me prior, how does the call it? Well them? see that's the whole thing. If you actually have a system like that, then you can't sign an agreement with three people because they'll already be in agreement. Let's say Shane had already signed with Andrea you can't sign it with her now. You realize that your broker Brian agreement is no longer valid. You see what I'm saying? Just like a listing agreement. I could sign a listing agreement with Alicia, but I go to put in the MLS, I can't because she already had one with Anna. That's the MLS already stops that. So is there a system already to stop that? I, I shouldn't we that. have a system. I've seen a system. We don't have it in place because we didn't think we needed it, but <laughs> apparently we do. So I don't know if we're going to use that one or what's going to happen, but I can tell you there are systems that have that. Yes. 
when I was working at Park Square House, people would come with one realtor, and a few days later, after the contract executed, they want to change it because they don't like the realtor. I mean, how is it going to work? You so, can release. And I, I said, I guess, that's it, my time. You drop your contract, and I will lower my, my, my commission. You change realtors, you know, and, and they can't do it because you cannot force anyone to work with you. You can you release someone. From a contract, even the broker buyer agreement has a release, but the broker has to release them. Like, I don't care. I'd release a buyer any day. I don't really care. Is there a form for that? The, the broker just has to release them. I'll show you. There's a form. If somebody says. It's an actual form. You just need to get it in writing that the broker will release you. Email. But I guarantee you, if there's a system, there's probably a way that they would have to go in and release them. I'm sure there's an actual more formal way that With they would the release them. wants to release the agent. Yeah. I, I really don't like working with you or whatever. It's just an email. Right now, that's what would probably happen. Broker, the broker says you've been released. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Broker. Yeah, like if, if um, Alicia had a broker agreement with Anna and she wasn't happy, then uh, you can contact me. I could release you from that and then you could work with somebody else. I mean, that happens all the time. That's not a problem. Yeah. But in the future, because it's going to become more of a situation, guys, more than likely, it'll be a more formalized thing if there's a system that monitors that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just like a listing agreement. Listen, you can get a listing agreement doesn't mean you can drop it. Do I do I cancel listing agreements? Mm -hmm. No, I don't. But buyers are gonna be a little different. I mean, just the reality. Yeah, no worries. So any other questions about that? There's gonna be more questions. We're gonna have a lot of questions, I'm sure. And really, until we get the systems in place that actually does this, we're really not going to have the right answers. But I can tell you because I did see that system. There are systems that do this. And they're very simple. But you do have AKA when people tell, tell their name one way and then it goes another yeah, way. It's true. And if, I mean, they can do whatever. I think we need to trust our clients anyway because no. if well, you want to throw up a group right now before this change, they will do it anyway. I mean, so there's the two things about that. The, the point of the, the broker buyer agreement is really for the customer's understanding. That's why they're making them do it, that the customer understands two things. The customer understands what the they're supposed to be getting from the broker, right? What the obligations are that the broker's providing and that the customer may have to pay. The customer is now becoming obligated to pay when the real estate gets procured. That's what you're forgetting. Now, because the commission is no longer going to be offered in the MLS, someone's going to have to pay the broker or the agent who's finding them the property. That's what the agreement's for. Well, <laughs> you need an agreement. Things that listing agents do, like give a commission. I mean, I'm, uh, when I'm selling my property, when I'm building a house and I'm selling, I mean, I want to get more money, obviously, but I know that nobody will work for free, so I'll give anyway three for ten million dollars. We're the ones because, that still get three yeah, to the buy side. And of course, you will. On that side. But the point is, who's going to know that? How are you going to get that word out? I show it to my clients. I show my personal. That's listing, the point. And I I pay on my That's my listing, point, though. And I sell them within five days, always. Yeah, I but the point is. Sales. A lot of customers won't know. A lot of yeah, buyers agents won't know. Right. Yeah, <laughs> but right. but this is what we're this is how we're looking at it. How are we going to get the word out that our sellers are still offering the co broke? That's the point. Number one. Number two. The buyer broker agreement is important for the buyer to understand what services the agent is providing and their obligations to pay for those services. That is the importance and that they're going to be held liable for paying for those services at the closing if they can't be negotiated in. Can we that information flyer at the house? Like, don't worry about I'm that. sure that will be okay because it's not in the MLS. So as long as they're not in the MLS, you're fine. I think the most important thing is it just cannot be in the MLS and it cannot be on a website showing another person's. So you couldn't show someone else's listing with, an, with a co-broke, but you can show your own, not a problem. So like, I guess, so like letting people know. So like I do active type emails whenever I have you know, my listing. Yeah. But because it's coming because yours yeah sure but, oh, so like, yeah 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 absolutely so so, so far exactly right so far from everything they're saying there's there's no 
any kind of problem with that because you're just talking about what you're representing. Any, like brokers open, type of exactly. mm -hmm. But it's all on you and your advertising, right? But you can't talk about the one down the street. That's another broker that's offering it. But why would you, right? It doesn't make any sense anyway. But that's really what it's talking about. It's <laughs> and you definitely don't want to talk about. It. So yeah, but does everybody see that? So it's it's really not a negative for us in a lot of ways when our sellers are the ones offering it. The negative is going to be for the people that aren't offering it. That's the point. And this is what the public is not understanding because they're going to think, oh, great, I don't have to offer it. Well, good luck trying to sell it. See, people don't understand that part of the whole equation. And how about the public just approaching listing agents directly just to buy without the presentation? Well, is the listing agent going to get paid? Because why would the listing agent want to work for free? Well, because everything is negotiable, right? So the listing agent's going to just tell the seller, I'll give you a percentage for a little bit more. I'll be able to hand it to buyer, but we have now. But to your point, the, the listing yeah. agent is now going to negotiate with the seller to pay their commission as if they're the buyer's agent. Yeah. They could totally do that. But with what do they use their name? Well, then why would you work for free? But what if the, the buyer just doesn't want the agent, right? He just wants to go straight to the So market. here's your point. The buyer's not willing to pay you. The seller's not willing to pay you. Are you going to work for free? I wouldn't. Yeah, why would you work for free? But there is, like, there is a lot of people talking, like, but Flavia, we do not have to work for free. So if the seller's not willing to pay you as the buyer's agent, the buyer's not willing to pay you, who's writing that contract? Who's going to be covered under errors of admission if they choose to sue you? That's my question. Yeah. So you don't work for free. I wouldn't work for free. If you choose to work for free, that's your own fault. I wouldn't do that. That's a bad business decision. Oh, mm -hmm. It can make the sense. Well, I think what she's, what I think what Bobby is saying is that, so like, let's say that she's the mm -hmm. yes, and the buyer comes to her directly, and yes, and then the buyer doesn't want to sign, seller doesn't want to sign, but I guess then you would just try to negotiate with the seller. Correct. Like, oh, if the seller doesn't want to pay her anymore, mm -hmm. so let's say she's getting paid three percent by the seller, she says, okay, give me an extra whatever percentage to cover him to say no, and then she says to the buyer, okay, pay me whatever, and I'll represent it. They say no. Why does she not have to pay? For that? She says, "Sorry, go work for, go get Somebody someone else to pay for it." Search yeah, for a company. Right. Just, just as like the public. But that's that right is now. exactly the right, the problem. It is a misconception, but then you don't work for that customer because they are not paying you. The seller is not paying you. The buyer is not paying you. If you work for free, you are assuming all liability on that. And that's the concern. Yeah, so you don't work for free. You say, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. You don't want to pay for my representation. The seller is not going to pay for you. You have to get someone else to represent you. Exactly. That's even right for you because you can go to Google and send you a contract. Exactly. You're not representing him, but I don't think they will go and try to do a full contract without knowing what they're doing. As soon as they see it, they will. But as soon as they do that, who's going to help with the inspection? Who's going to help with all those things? Exactly. So you don't do it. I would not do it. Exactly. Yeah. Now you want to represent the buyer. Exactly. It's another job. It's another liability. Exactly. Absolutely. Work that you have to work for. Right. And if you're not going to get paid for it, you're assuming all liability and all the work for free. Why would you do that? Well, I, so I think to the end of the point is this is where a lot of those those agents that don't know what they're doing are going to get flushed out because in yes. that situation, you if you were a strong agent, thing. you would negotiate with the buyer and say, well, if you really want this house, then we got to represent you. Exactly. If you really talk to the seller and you really want to get your house sold, we need to buy, you know, represent Absolutely. Exactly. So to your point, absolutely right. Don't know what they're doing. That's where they're going to get flushed out. You're 100% right. Listen, this is going to be bumpy and it's going to be messy and there's going to be lawsuits and it's going to be ugly. It's just not going to be ugly with us because we're not going to work for free. We're not going to do that. And that's exactly the point. But are we going to see that in this industry? We are. And I mean, to the end of the point also, I mean, clients hire some of these agents because they, you know, work right. the highest of the best. 
So, you know, to that point, like, if you want the best, you got to pay for the best. Exactly. If you walk into Armani, are they going to give you a suit for free? No. <laughs> I know. If they do, let me know. I'm coming up. <laughs> Harry. Oh. That comes in the bar. Like, I already bought three homes in my life. I mm -hmm. even know how to write a bunch of great high deposit. So you could represent yourself by no contract. Yeah, but you better get a uh, you better get an attorney to write a hold harmless. You better hold harmless. Yes, who had a who had something to say? Is it Carrie? Yeah. Yes, okay. I had something to ask. So. I want to give you an example of something that happened like a year or two years ago because okay. um, I thought it would be somewhat applicable. So I was the listing agent and there was a buyer that was interested in my listing and the first agent did a FaceTime showing on my property and those buyers were like in New York or something. Sorry. And then... The second agent came and showed the property and those buyers actually went under contract with the second agent on my listing. So like, let's say fast forward to now or to the rules now, that could get pretty sticky if what happens if that first agent didn't release them and then it holds up like the, sell, the sale of your property, you know, your listing. Well, here's the thing to your point, Care. It wouldn't hold up the sale of your listing. Yet no one can go for procuring costs until after it closes. So after it closes, you're out of it. They hold the commission uh, at the title company. And then what happens is then they go to the board. They have 180 days to file. And then they go through the process to see who gets the money. But you don't have to worry about it. You're out of it. It's really between those two agents fighting over their commission. So it would never hold up the sale because if they hold up the sale, that's called impediment of the sale. And then both of them are in violation of the code of ethics. Okay. A good point. Mm -hmm. Can they address how this is going to affect open houses if somebody comes in and you're showing them? No. House? Great point, though. Great point. No, open houses has not been addressed. One thing they did address which they came up with in January, by the way. Does anybody know that they came up with a addenda? Uh, Alejandro, you need to look at this. It's called Site Unseen Property Disclosure and Acknowledgement. Remember, you said you didn't think the guy saw it. You need to get this signed. Uh-huh. So this is a new addenda that basically releases the brokerage from all liability if the buyer has not seen or has only seen the property via FaceTime or some kind of virtual. So in because we all know what happens. These people see the home virtually, walk through it that way, sometimes only with pictures. They come and buy it and then they want to sue you or the sellers because they say it doesn't look like the pictures or there was something wasn't as they wanted. It happens all the time. But what happens is when they come and they close on it or sometimes they get to closing or the walkthrough and then they're fighting over X, Y, and Z. Before that, make them sign this. It's a complete release. I love this. I don't know how I didn't know that this came out either. January of this year, it came out. Why didn't these things not get released to us? I have no idea. This is a fabulous hold harmless. Huh? Uh, no, what? You could use it for new construction too. If you were the builder? If you were the builder, I would use this. If you're going and representing a buyer at, you know, Toll Brothers, you know, they're going to go after Toll, not you. I don't really care. But if you were the builder, yeah, I would be using this, right? Make them sign it. Make them sign it. Because if you don't believe that they came to see and if they can't prove to you that they came to see them, have them sign that. This is a hold harmless for us, for you, because they can't come back and say, oh, this isn't as we saw it in pictures. It's a great one. So this is a really important new document that you make that you definitely want to make sure you know is out there. That's a good one, right, guys? Mm -hmm. 
I know. I was like, what? This is a new one. Uh, another thing that uh, some of the more updates that came out. Frisp, they have a new condominium addenda that they, well, it's the condominium addenda has been there, but basically they've revised some of the language, but we don't really use Crisp, so don't worry about that one. There, they have changed the language in the cooperative addendum. Now, we don't really sell co-ops here, but just so you are aware, I put it in here. We're going to look at that. One thing that they did who is their a septic program replacement addendum. This form has been added to additional resources for buyers to check regarding any county septic replacement program. Guys, there has been several lawsuits about septic recently. So this is a really good one. And I'm going to show you this one. We're going to look at that one. Uh, and then obviously we looked at the last two already, the tenant um, buyer retainer program. And then of course, how we've already adjusted the listing. This one right here, oops, I have to admit somebody, hold on, participants, admit Kate Hoffman. All right, this one is right here, oh, let's go back. This is the septic program replacement addenda. Now, what's great about this one, guys, and, you know, it's probably one of my screen, but what this does is it actually makes it subject to and this means that it becomes an actual contingency of the contract. So the buyer is going to be responsible for the cost of it, as you see. Now, the buyer has the one who gets to conduct the, the actual um, inquiries with the county, okay, and all that. But in the event that the inquiry reveals any facts that are unacceptable to the buyer and the buyer's sole discretion, Regarding the availability, implementation schedule, assessments and capacity, fees, hookups, connection, uh, decommission or repair, replacement or credits, buyers can cancel the contract by delivering seller written election within three days after the expiration of this. The only way this can become an actual contingency of this sale, you have to incorporate it into your contract. So don't forget on the bottom of whether you're doing an as is or you're doing a residential, you have to check other. You have to add it because it's not one of these typical ones here. You have to add it, the septic replacement one right here. And then you have to add it into the contract. If you do not incorporate this in, it will not be contingent. Everybody good with that? You all follow me? But it is really important because we have seen more uh, lawsuits over septic lately than I care to talk about. Yes. <laughs> Shane can speak to that. And that was on a home. How expensive was that property? Like the septic backed up and flooded the entire house. And then when they came out, they said septic systems weren't permitted. Uh, but which is not there. true because we gave them the inspection report. We were on both sides, guys. It was a total mess. Yeah, yeah, it was a total mess. But thank God we did all the right things on both sides. But this is the point. So this is a really important one, that one right there. Do you have to go along with the inspection? Yes. But it's, it's actually its own thing because you're writing an addenda, giving yourself time to for how long you can cancel by. So you have the time frame in there. But yes, you have to get it done within the inspection period. Yes, you do. Okay. Good question. Now this one... Um, oh, this one is in regards to, let me take a quick peek. This is the addendum for contract and sale purchase agreement. And this one has to do with the fact that they have changed the time frame over here for the, uh, um, association document. So they're 10 days now, just so you know, in case you wanted to check that, um, and also what they have done is they have added the milestone report. Everybody understands the milestone reports, right? That are required on certain uh, different uh, condominiums. If they're over three feet tall, depending on how close they are to the water, they can be certain years, like 25 years, if they're 30 years, if they're not within, was it five miles to the water? And it gives you right here. And there's two things. They have to have an integrity of the actual structure and then the integrity of the reserves. Because what's happened in many buildings, sadly, is that 
you know, people have owned them there forever and they've run their own homeowners association boards, right? Or their condo association boards. And they're like, oh, we have plenty of reserves. So they stopped really collecting a lot of the reserves. And then when it comes to you need to maybe re, you know, really fix the integrity of that structure, you don't have enough money. And now all these homeowners are being assessed $150,000. They don't have $150,000 because they now have to rebuild the infrastructure of this building because it can no longer withstand the uh, the structure of like, let's say a hurricane comes through or what have you. Everybody knows what happened. Was it two years ago down by the water where that building tumbled? That's where this milestone and this came about. So this uh, went into law, I think two years ago now. And it, it's uh, something that is very important. If you've got somebody purchasing a condominium that they understand the milestone inspection two things see the structural capability of the building and the structural capability of the reserves the reserves have to be there to be able to rebuild the actual building everybody good on that all right and that was the unseen one. Oh, and then the contract to lease this was important. If anybody does a contract to lease, they change that the money due before occupancy has to be in U.S. dollars. I don't know what they were collecting before, but apparently it didn't say it was in U.S. dollars. So now everybody has to put it in U.S. dollars. So that's a new one. Um, let's see. There's a septic program agenda. Did I miss any of them? Uh, there's the cooperative agenda. That's what I added the milestones. Uh, okay. Any questions about any of these changes? I think I hit them all. Let's see. Now I wanted to show you this. Oops. I didn't. Share screen. Couple things I want you to look at. Uh, that was like really big in it. All right. Again, in your buyer section, I have also put in the, not only the retainer in case you want to put the showing agreement. So if you choose not to use the actual buyer broker agreement, you also have a showing agreement. Does everybody know what the showing agreement is? If you don't do an exclusive broker buyer agreement, but you want to show a home and that one particular home doesn't have either a commission offered or it's a dollar or it's a 1% and you want the buyer to agree to pay you for that particular home, this is what the showing agreement is for. You can actually use this instead of a overreaching agreement about all properties where you say, okay, these properties... Uh, or maybe they're for several owners. Maybe you're going to show the guy off market properties. You could say for these properties, you'll agree to pay me a commission for these. So if you don't feel like doing a one agreement for everything, you can do a showing agreement. And the showing agreement is where you list the properties that you're going to be showing. And everything else is the same on here. This is where they say how much they will pay you. They'll compensate you. Now, again, if you can get the seller to pay all or part of it, then that will come from what they've agreed to pay you. So that is the same, but it's only on these particular properties, not on everything you show them. I don't personally like that one because now if you have to show them five other things, you have to keep adding to it. You know, so that's that's like, um, I would just do a broker buyer agreement, but yes. One question. Uh, yes. Yes. With the new law, as in the buyer's agreement, uh, the contract that you said that you know, over there does not specify like the seller does not pay the commission, the buyer will pay the commission, correct? What doesn't specify that that the commission that you don't know if the seller is going to be paying or not. So can that be put in as a contingency? So it is in the buyer broker agreement and in the showing agreement. Let me show you. In here, it says compensation. The broker compensation of, let's say you want 3% or a blank dollar amount is earned during the term of the agreement. The buyer or any person acting on behalf of the buyer contracts to acquire the interest in the property. The broker will seek compensation from the listing office. However, if the listing office uh, offers no compensation 
the broker will ask the seller to pay part of the offer to pay the broker's compensation. If the seller and the listing office refuses to pay broker's compensation, the buyer will pay. it. So that's the thing. So it tells you very clearly, you're going to ask the seller to pay for it. And if they pay all or part of it, that will be subtracted from what the buyer will agree to pay. So if you say it's 3% and the, the seller says, okay, I'll pay 2%, then the buyer only has to pay 1%. It's the same thing in the broker buyer agreement. Are you sure? In the broker buyer agreement? Sure. Broker buyer, that was the, the showing agreement and the broker buyer agreement. That one, I, no, I just switched it, oh. but it was the showing agreement when I was showing. This one says the same thing. Compensation. Broker's compensation is earned when, during the term of the agreement or any renewal or extension, buyer or any person acting on behalf of the buyer contracts to acquire any real property as specified in this agreement. Buyer will be responsible for paying broker the amount specified below. I don't know why it says plus any real estate taxes. That always confuses people. Broker receives from a seller uh amount which broker receives from a seller or real estate licensee who is working with the seller. So they'll, uh, sorry, will but will be credited with any amount the broker receives from the seller. So if the they say 3% and the, the seller is giving them 2%, that will be credited towards the 3% and the buyer will only be paying the 1% left. So it's okay, the same thing. Like that. In the broker buyer agreement. Now we have to use it. Now we have to use it. Mm -hmm. So we probably ourselves. Correct. Work with exactly. You got it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I read somewhere um, that if you do a buyer broker agreement and you agree for some reason for 2%. Okay. okay. But the seller's offering 3%. Mm -hmm. I heard that you cannot get more than what's on the broker broker part. That's not it's true. Right? No. Will you then get 5%? No. The seller, if they're giving you three, I love that. But if you are giving, let's say they were going to pay you two and now the seller is giving you three, the buyer simply owes you nothing. Can you do to the buyer, okay, I'll charge, no, 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 okay, $10,000 and whatever the sellers pay, if they don't pay anything. That's what the retainer is. is. And if the seller pays something, then that's on top. That's what the retainer part is. All credited or not credited. That's, a that's so much worse because then they're going to say, okay, well, the seller's offering 3%, so let's just negotiate lower. And then the sub, you know. I wouldn't go that route. You, again, people are used to a percentage, a commission. I would stick with what people are used to. And again, you can always try to negotiate it in. And one interesting thing that I think she said, Joanna Walken said, I think it was Joanna, could have been Margie. But anyway, that um, the FHA and the VA, that they're very much aware of the situation and they're working on a solution, because I know we've been talking about this for forever since 2019, of trying to get it so that it can be covered in the loan to, so it looks like it's not part of the loan. So that is something that they're still working on, but at least they feel like they're getting closer to a solution, which I thought was great. Um, but it, you know, I don't feel that the, um, cause remember we still have the appraisal gap addenda. So God forbid it was a VA. We know it can't be part of their closing costs, but we certainly can get the, if the seller's not willing to pay for the, let's say the 3%, you could say, well, we can increase the price of the home 3%. Then you could pay the seller's agent 3%. And if the home doesn't appraise, we could do an appraisal gap for that 3%. Because the VA can pay that. It says in their sole right and discretion, they have the ability to pay for that. And you can use an appraisal gap addenda, which is also, it's a total mess, but at least we can do that. <laughs> yeah, we have to jump I through mean, hoops now. It's weird because we do this every day, but try to yeah. say that to a VA buyer or a first time home buyer. Well, what it's going to really be bad for is the first time home buyers. You can't do, they can't overpay because they can't get the home if the home doesn't appraise. So you can't do that. They don't have the money to come out of pocket because they don't have the money to come out of pocket to pay your closing costs. If the, if the seller says no, what do you do? You know, I think using the retainer's fee can be against you too because you want to charge certain amount right 
they are buyers that they don't sell you everything they have. Uh, it oh yeah. To me, you know, one buyer was uh, supposed to be buying a four hundred thousand dollar home, and then from one day to another, you know what? I have the money. I need to buy like fourteen properties. In I'm like, and then I find out that he was a very rich guy from uh, another company. You know, so you never know with clients. It's true, you don't. If you put a retainer fee and you put this in amount, what happens if he changes his mind and he buys something else? Well, usually the retainer, the way I used the retainer before was in addition to commission. It was never only. Oh, okay. I used it in addition to commission. It was to cover my time if they didn't buy anything. If they did, it was that and commission. You think I don't? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I used to yeah. Come on, Anna. I'm not working for free. <laughs> Unless it was a renter. And I don't work yeah. with renters, but yeah. I'm used to every time I was a contract printing out the MLS sheet and sending it to them, because then it also says the commission. Somebody can change it midway. Yeah, you can't do that anymore. Okay. So well, I mean, now you can, but in July. They say, okay, I don't, we're offering 3%. You need to get it in writing. What another oh, form they're coming up with, they will be. They're working on that now. That is another form they're coming up with, which is a compensation so agreement form. Say, oh, 3%. oh, no, that was that no. one week. They're, only. they're <laughs> coming up with a compensation agreement form, like a referral form type of thing, but it'll be a compensation agreement form. Yeah, Margie Grant said that was one of the other forms they're coming up with. There are several forms they're coming up with, guys. They're revising all sorts of things. One of the things I'll probably be adding very shortly into our listing agreements is that all commissions are negotiable, which they always are, but they're going to want that's one of the things they'll be adding into our every listing that is a new addition. So that'll be going in there. But other than that, I mean, there'll be some new forms coming out for sure. All of them will be coming out in May. So we can look forward to that. I know that. But this is the new stuff that we have. So now everybody's up to date with everything we currently have. So we know that. Um, any questions about anything we went over? I think we've learned some new stuff here today. Very good. Um, but uh, yeah, I was surprised. I was like, wow, you had some new things and I didn't even know about it. Like uh, that, the one that, that's, that you... Purchasing a property site unseen. That's a great one to cover yourself. I didn't know that came out in January. That's a great one. So these are some things that we should know our inner arsenal, be able to use them, prepare ourselves. But as these new forms come out, I'm on the lookout. We also should know that on Florida Realtors, they have uh, the, the form here about keeping up with the NAR settlement, everything you need to know. So these are all the latest NAR updates. So hopefully... I was hoping they would have our contact on contracts up here, see fact sheets, Q and A settlement agreements, but they didn't have anything about the contract updates there. So, oh, you can't. Oh, that's weird. Okay, hold on. Escape. Can you see it now? Can you see it now? There we go. Yes. Yeah, so here is uh, keeping up with the NAR. And it's, it's on National Association of Realtors. Like that's where Florida Realtors brings you over. But I was hoping that would keep us up with the forms, but it doesn't. So, I will definitely make sure I'm up on the form. So no worries there. Um, and then also just so you guys know, remember uh, on May 29th, the Not, um, Orlando Regional Realtors Association, we have our brand new building. It's called Welcome Home. It's our big event. And uh, we'll having our award ceremonies for production It'll be scrolling there. We'll have opportunities for photos and be sending out um, your production banners and all of that good stuff. So that'll be exciting. So that'll be going on there as well. But it'll be a fun event. That is from three to seven. And that is in May, though. So we have some time. I'll keep talking about that. Um, and then on Thursday, remember, 10 o'clock is the... Um, the the buyer's uh, presentation panel, which Budge will be hosting at 10. So I hope everybody registers for that. Any other questions or anything anybody's uh, wondering about? No? Well, I hope you guys got some good stuff here today. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks, everybody, for jumping on. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.